Welcome to Washington Today on C-SPAN Radio for Wednesday, December 27, 2023. The Michigan Supreme Court rejects a lawsuit challenging former President Donald Trump's candidacy for the presidency under the U.S. Constitution's Insurrection Clause in the 14th Amendment. We'll talk with USA Today Supreme Court correspondent John Fritzy about the Michigan case and similar case in Colorado, which went the other way, and whether this issue will end up before the U.S. Supreme Court. Republican pollster Frank Luntz assesses the state of the 2024 race for president at an event held by the group No Labels, which is considering backing a third-party candidate. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas are in Mexico City meeting with the Mexican president about immigration and border security as upwards of 10,000 migrants a day have been arriving at the U.S.-Mexico border in recent days. Israel, again, very critical of the United Nations, saying it is not staying neutral in Israel's war with Hamas, but actively supporting Hamas. And Russia convenes an informal meeting of the United Nations Security Council and invites briefers that back only its narrative that the 2014 revolution in Ukraine against the pro-Russian leader was a de facto coup carried out by the U.S. and other Western nations, and that the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine was justified by mistreatment of Russian-speaking Ukrainians. Every other country's ambassador who spoke at today's meeting rejected those views as outright false. An article at USA Today begins, Michigan's highest court sided with former President Donald Trump on Wednesday in the latest lawsuit challenging whether he can appear on a state's ballot or whether he disqualified himself by inciting the mob that stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6, 2021. Joining us on the phone now is the reporter on that story, John Fritzy, Supreme Court correspondent. Welcome to Washington Today. Thank you. Did the Michigan Supreme Court give a reason for its decision today? Not really. You know, we didn't get much from the court. We got a basically a single paragraph order uh, saying that uh, they didn't feel that they could really resolve this issue. And there has been a good a deal of question about how much um, jurisdiction state courts have to resolve uh, this this constitutional uh, federal election question. Uh, and so really, there was just one line in the order uh, uh, explaining why they weren't going to take this appeal. Uh, there was a dissent from one of the justices uh, arguing that she felt that the court should have taken it, uh, taken up the case and sort of given a decision on the merits, uh, you know, maybe to help settle this issue um, a little bit. But that's that's all we saw from the court. This comes after the Colorado Supreme Court recently ruled the other way. Are there any differences between the states that could account for the judges reaching different opinions? Yeah, I mean, I think it's first uh, worth noting that a lot of courts that have looked at this have sided Trump's way. Uh, Federal court in New Hampshire didn't take up this case. The Supreme Court in Minnesota a little while back. A lot of courts have looked at this and have decided that they're not going to uh, take Trump off the ballot. Colorado is a little bit of an outlier in some ways, at least so far. There is a difference in the state laws between uh, Colorado and Michigan, uh, and that deals with a line in the Colorado election law about the Secretary of State putting qualified candidates on the ballot. And what we're really talking about here is qualifications. Is uh, Donald Trump qualified uh, given this provision of the Constitution that disqualifies candidates who are involved in insurrection. What a lot of these other courts have is, look, this is a state primary, and parties have a good deal of control in determining who goes on those primary ballots. It's a little bit different from the general election, where the state does have more control. Uh, but in this case, in a lot of cases, a lot of states, uh, we're talking about decisions made by political, state political parties. We're talking with John Fritzy, Supreme Court correspondent with USA Today. There have been a lot of lawsuits on this issue in a lot of states around the country. Now we have a split between one state and most of the other states on this 14th Amendment question. Is this going to the U.S. Supreme Court and when? Right. I mean, that's the real question here. And I think, um, I, although... This Michigan case is is interesting. Michigan's obviously an important battleground in this country. And so whatever they say is going to get a lot of attention, rightfully. So the the real fight here, I think, at this point is is the Colorado case. And 
I think that's because it almost certainly will wind up before the Supreme Court. Trump's attorneys have said they will appeal that decision. I think it's likely the Supreme Court will take it, although you never know until they do. Um, uh, If they didn't take it, it would allow the Colorado uh, ruling to stand, which would inspire a bunch of other litigation across the country uh, and prompt a lot of other courts to move and sort of get into this area. I think it's likely the court will will the Supreme Court will jump in and sort of at least resolve some of the issues about whether this section is self executing. That is whether it can be enforced without a law by Congress. Perhaps whether it applies to a president. Uh, some of the courts, including lower courts in Colorado, said that it did not apply to uh, presidential candidates. So I think the Supreme Court is likely to sort of weigh in here and resolve some of these issues, and that will probably help resolve. Um, You know, these really dozens of similar lawsuits that have cropped up across the country. As the state courts have been making these, taking these cases, making decisions and the Supreme Court, maybe. Are there any precedents that they're following or is this brand new ground? It's pretty new ground. I mean, you know, so this is we're talking about a reconstruction era provision of the Constitution that was really intended to block uh, folks who sided with the Confederacy from regaining power in the reconstructed nation. Um, There are some cases back from that period uh, dealing with um, uh, uh, Senate candidates and judicial candidates and so forth, uh, but but really not for a president. Um, It's it's pretty dramatic and and pretty unprecedented to have courts uh, trying to raise and look at this question for a presidential candidate. And so um, that, that part is pretty new ground. Um, and perhaps uh, maybe part of the reason why the Supreme Court wants to weigh in here and, and at least settle some some part of it. John Fritzy is Supreme Court correspondent for USA Today. His stories can be found at usatoday.com and on X, formerly Twitter, at J Fritzy. Thank you very much and happy holidays. Thank you. And Donald Trump reacting to the Michigan Supreme Court decision on social media, calling it a desperate Democrat attempt to take the leading candidate in the 2024 presidential election, me, off the ballot. And he said we have to prevent the 2024 election being rigged and stolen like they stole 2020. And a few of his supporters in Congress also tweeting about this. Troy Nels, Republican of Texas, writing, the radical left will stop at nothing to prevent President Trump from stripping power from radical Democrats and getting us back on track. Rightfully, the Michigan Supreme Court rejected liberal attempts to keep President Trump off the state's 2024 ballot. This is a huge win for America. And former President Trump today is lawyers also calling for the Secretary of State for Maine to recuse herself on an upcoming decision about his ballot eligibility under the 14th Amendment of the Constitution, citing her past statements about the January 6, 2021 Capitol riot, claiming she's already decided Donald Trump engaged in insurrection. In Maine, it's the Secretary of State deciding first who's on the ballot, and then that can be appealed to the state court. And Special Counsel Jack Smith filing in U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia today a motion seeking to limit what statements Donald Trump can make leading up to his scheduled March 4th federal trial on alleged 2020 election interference that includes a request to prevent Donald Trump from telling the jury he is being prosecuted by the Justice Department in coordination with President Biden as well as suggestions by Donald Trump of undercover agents fomenting violence at the Capitol riots and of foreign influence in the 2020 election. Jack Smith's team telling the judge, Tanya Chutkin, through public statements, filings, and argument in hearings before the court, the defense has attempted to inject into this case partisan political attacks and irrelevant and prejudicial issues that have no place in a jury trial. Pollster Frank Luntz spoke today about the 2024 race for president in a virtual discussion hosted by the group No Labels, which may support a third party candidate. And he talked about the viability of such a candidate. To start where we are right now, and we look at this every month, a majority of Americans, if Joe Biden is the Democrat and Donald Trump is the Republican, a majority of Americans will consider voting for a third-party candidate. And as you can see, there is some difference between Democrats and Republicans, but it's not huge. Because I want to dispel at the outset this idea that a third-party candidate leads to the election of Donald Trump. 
That is false. That is inaccurate. The reason why Trump at this point does slightly, ever so slightly better is because Joe Biden is doing so much worse. And as we get closer to these first votes of 2024, if you are a Democratic leaning person on this call, you should be apoplectic about your party's nominee. Not because of any issue, not because of, of any attributes other than one. And that's his age. And that is something that no campaign can fix. That is something that no spin doctor can change. And that has weakened him. But overall, it's eight, an eight point difference between half of all Democrats, 45% of all Republicans would consider voting for a third party candidate, an independent candidate. 80% of independents would. And let me show you the latest ballot test numbers that we have. Tied. I know that most polling right now, if you take a look at the net nationwide surveys, most polling is Donald Trump up by two on average. We have them dead even. And notice that a 20% will choose a unite, unity third party candidate. 15% of Democrats, 16% of independents, and it's the top choice among, uh, sorry, among Republicans and 37% among independents. By the way, I need to acknowledge to you, I know how many people are on this call. I know who's on this call, and I'm a little bit nervous because I got to get this right. But I want you to see this. A third party candidate draws 15% of Democrats and 16% of Republicans. Please tell me how that elects Donald Trump. It doesn't. Pollster and communications strategist Frank Luntz had a virtual discussion today held by the group no labels. This is Washington Today. A story from Reuters from Mexico City. Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador said on Wednesday the U.S. Congress should focus on investing in people instead of building walls hours before he was set to meet Secretary of State Antony Blinken to discuss migration to the United States. Lopez Obrador, who last week assured the United States that Mexico would help ease migratory pressures, said the U.S. Congress should be investing in poor people in Latin America and the Caribbean instead of putting up barriers, barbed wire fences in the river, or thinking about building walls. He said at a press conference, it is more efficient and more humane to invest in the development of the people, and that is what we have always proposed. The meetings, again writing from Reuters, come after more than half a million migrants this year crossed the dangerous Darien Gap jungle into Central America, double last year's record, many fleeing crime, poverty, and conflict to seek entry into the United States. White House spokesperson John Kirby previewed today's meetings last week when President Biden spoke to the Mexican president by phone. The president uh, had a chance this morning to speak by phone with President Lopez Obrador of Mexico. They had a chance to talk about ongoing efforts to manage the unprecedented migratory flows in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, building on the Los Angeles Declaration for Migration and Protection, that President Biden launched in Los Angeles back in June of 22. The two leaders agreed that additional enforcement actions are urgently needed so that key ports of entry can be reopened across our shared border. President Biden has asked Secretary of State Tony Blinken Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas and White House Homeland Security Advisor Liz Sher Sherwood Randall to travel to Mexico in coming days to meet with President Lopez Obrador and his team to discuss further actions that can be taken together to address current border challenges. John Kirby, spokesperson for the White House National Security Council, last Thursday in the White House briefing room and those meetings with those three Biden administration officials in Mexico City with the Mexican president are happening today. CNN reports that ahead of Wednesday's meetings, Homeland Security officials have discussed a range of ways Mexico can help drive down numbers at the U.S. border that will be among their asks, including moving migrants south, controlling the railways that are used by migrants to move north, and providing incentives to not journey to the border, like visas to remain in the country and avoid migrating irregularly. Congressman Russell Fry, Republican from South Carolina, was interviewed today on Fox News about immigration and border security and the Republicans' ongoing negotiations with the White House over an agreement on border security that can be added to the president's request for aid to Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. 
The issue with the border security is how uh, would necessarily uh, are the Democrats proposing to secure the border? What, what would they be giving you in exchange for the aid? Is it just more agents or more funds for processing purposes? Or would it actually be to finish parts of the wall, close up the border, stop the migrants from coming through? I saw numbers from 10,000 a day that they're proposing. It would, you know, diminish to 3,000 a day, some sort of compromise of that sort. Well, well, you know, we'll see what the text ultimately reveals. Right now, I think the ball's entirely within the Biden administration's court. Look, I mean, they were the ones from day one that suspended construction of the border wall, eviscerated uh, agreements between Guatemala, Honduras, and other countries. They stopped the Remain in Mexico policy. They've done everything to kind of eradicate this. Step one, in my mind, from a good faith standpoint, would be for them to reinitiate these, these policies that actually work. Uh, but the House has been pretty clear. Our position is HR to which we passed back in the spring, it will secure the border, it will toughen border security measures. And I think that's where ultimately, I hope uh, that, this, this, that this lands. Congressman Russell Fry, Republican from South Carolina, interviewed today on Fox News. The House and Senate are still on the holiday recess. They return January 3rd for opening day of the second session of the 118th Congress, but no legislative business expected until the following week. And from the New York Times today, President Biden left the drizzly skies of Washington behind on Wednesday and flew to St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands, where he and Jill Biden, the First Lady, intend to ring in the new year. The Bidens, along with their granddaughter Natalie, stepped off Air Force One and headed to a waiting SUV to start their week-long vacation. The Bidens are spending the week at the beachfront villa of friends and longtime Democratic donors Bill and Connie Neville. The three-bedroom home, which is listed on Airbnb for $700 per night, has an infinity pool, private beach access, and unobstructed views of Buck Island Reef National Monument. That from the New York Times. Wall Street today, the Dow up 111, Nasdaq up 24, S&P up 6. U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit granted Apple a temporary stay on enforcement of the International Trade Commission's prohibition on Apple selling its newest Apple Watch models in the United States. Apple was found to have violated a patent of Massimo dealing with measuring blood oxygen levels. Apple pulled its Watch Series 9 and Ultra 2 from stores last week. The Biden administration said yesterday it would let the ban take effect. Apple's appeal says it would suffer irreparable harm and wants the court to grant a stay long enough for U.S. Customs and Border Protection to decide whether a redesigned version of the Apple Watches can be allowed to be imported. WABC in New York City writes that preparations are underway for New Year's Eve celebrations in the city, with New York Police Department stepping up security amid heightened tensions over the crisis in the Middle East and an increased terror alert on Tuesday. Mayor Eric Adams laid out a plan to keep revelers safe, calling it a real Herculean task to maintain safety and security during the annual spectacle that is New Year's Eve in Times Square. Here's Mayor Adams at the news conference. Uh, I wanted to ask about security concerns uh, surrounding New Year's Eve. And I know the NYPD is going to be doing their briefing later on in the week, but I, I just wanted to ask, are there any sort of increased threat levels here, and I know that naturally, because it's New Year's Eve, because it's Times Square, the terror threat naturally rises, but is there anything new this year, anything that gives any sort of concern, any new strategies, more deployment of officers, anything that you can say about what's going to be going on down there? Oh, we're, go we're going to use uh, technology a lot this year, number one. Number two, as you know, there's always a serious concern around safety in New Year's Eve, because there's a large number of people, everyone, you know, look for uh, events like this if they want to do bad things. And the police department is on top of it. Uh, there's an added concern because of uh, the uh, some of the protests you have been seeing. And there was an attempt to disrupt the tree lighting. And uh, we're sure that there's going to be some type of attempt this year uh, to use that stage uh, for some other concerns that people are having. Uh, the police department did an amazing job during the tree lighting to to uh, mitigate any form of major disruptions, and they're going to do it this year. Uh, and I just think last year, many people don't recall, in the midst of that, we had that uh, assault on the two police officers, 
and the NYPD analyze our response to that. And we're making sure uh, that we don't use uh, distractions to get in the way of staying on our post, staying on our locations, and making sure that we uh, uh, not allow someone to pull us off. There's, there's something that's known in policing, um, particularly when there's some type of terrorist action of secondary uh, devices and things like that. They want to draw attention from one area to go to a specific target area. We are really exercising our mental muscles to make sure that that does not happen. People have to maintain their locations and use minimum deployment from where a particular incident is happening, happening, so that we do not allow people to take us off our of, of, of our goals. So there's some different strategies that we're going to put in place this year uh, to take into account all of these circumstances. And as always, we're monitoring the chatter. You know, we're man- monitoring the chatter out there so we could be pre- we could be prepared. And is there anything to that chatter? I know you mentioned the protests, and that's certainly a concern. But any any lone wolf, anything on this chatter, anything that's being picked up by anybody? Oh, uh, I I wouldn't. You know, if we did, we wouldn't. You know, we wouldn't mention that. Uh, it's important for our intel division under Chief Weiner, um, Commissioner Dep- Com- Deputy Commissioner Weiner, uh, to you know determine to let the police know so they could deploy deploy correctly. Um, but you know, lone wolves are challenging. Like the 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 individual the perpetrator last year he wasn't on anyone's radar you know uh, his assault his assault on those two police officers you just you have to be ready for those unpredictable circumstances it's a real herculean task to manage that number of people uh, without being heavy-handed but being protective New York City Mayor Eric Adams at a news conference on Tuesday and today at least 26 people been arrested during a pro-Palestinian protest, demonstrators blocking a major New York City freeway inside John F. Kennedy International Airport. More on the war between Israel and Hamas and also between Russia and Ukraine when Washington Today continues in a moment. People often think C-SPAN is funded by the federal government. In fact, we're a nonprofit organization that receives no government funding. As news consumption changes, you can help ensure the future of C-SPAN's unfiltered coverage of national government and politics. We hope you'll consider making a tax-deductible contribution that will support our daily editorial operations. To learn more, visit cspan.org forward slash donate. Welcome back to Washington Today, available as a podcast on the C-SPAN Now mobile app, which is free, and also podcast available wherever you find your podcasts. The White House is welcoming the appointment of former Deputy Prime Minister of the Netherlands, Sigrid Kaag, as the new United Nations Senior Humanitarian and Reconstruction Coordinator for Gaza. The position was created by the United Nations Security Council resolution vote last week, a vote in which the U.S. and Russia abstained. A statement from White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan says the appointment is an important step as we continue to work with the U.N. as a critical partner in the delivery and distribution of life-saving humanitarian assistance in Gaza. Israel, though, is criticizing the United Nations again today. Elon Levy, spokesperson for the Israeli Prime Minister, spoke at his daily news conference. As we intensify efforts to protect civilians in Gaza, the state of Israel categorically rejects allegations by Hamas complicit UN official Paula Gaviria Bentako, the special rapporteur on the human rights of IDPs, that Israel is somehow working to expel the civilian population of Gaza. Since before the ground offensive, Israel has designated the Al Muwasi area as a humanitarian zone and urged Gazan civilians to evacuate there temporarily for their safety. We want civilians to be protected in areas where Hamas is not already using them as human shields by hiding under their homes, schools, mosques, hospitals and UN facilities. And Hamas has done all of this under the noses of UN officials like Ms. Gaviria Bentakor, who are covering up for Hamas by falsely claiming that Israel is targeting hospitals, schools and shelters without credible evidence that Hamas has exploited them for military purposes. And they do that just to avoid admitting that Hamas built a huge terror infrastructure right under their facilities. It is horrific that UN agencies have endangered civilians in Gaza by funneling them into Hamas strongholds instead of facilitating their safe evacuation to the humanitarian zone. 
It is horrific that instead of helping civilians find safety, UN officials are attacking Israel's decision to designate a safe zone as a violation of international law. Honestly, it's beyond parody. We hold these agencies culpable for the loss of life as a result of this negligence, resisting our efforts to help civilians find safety inside the Gaza Strip. And it's horrific that UN agencies cannot bring themselves to condemn Hamas for shooting rockets at Israeli communities from out of the humanitarian zone. Civilians must be protected. They must be protected from Hamas. Ironically, the only people encouraging the mass displacement of Gazans right now are those who falsely label most of them refugees and indulge their dreams of relocating into sovereign Israeli territory through violent struggle instead of living in peace alongside us. We will not tolerate UN officials deflecting blame onto Israel to cover up the fact that they are covering up for Hamas. And we repeat our demand for global accountability, because when global institutions are hijacked in this way, these Hamas complicit officials let the whole world down. Elon Levy, spokesperson for Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at a news conference today. Francesca Albanese is United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Palestinian Occupied Territory. That's the official name. She was interviewed on Al Jazeera English TV about the Israeli government's decision this week to not automatically approve visas for U.N. personnel. Israel has devastated Gaza. Israel has destroyed Gaza. And we are still blaming the U.N.? I still wonder how the international community gives credit to Israel and how international media still give credit to what Israeli leaders, political and military leaders, say. Israel should be held accountable for what it does. Israel has not done anything to keep civilians safe. Let me give you three examples. First of all, Israel has used... uh, ammunitions that are meant to create huge destruction. Even the Washington Post and the New York Times have given a sense, have produced investigative reports uh, saying that Israel has used over 80 days the uh, uh, level of ammunition that are equal to two and more than two nuclear bombs in the Gaza Strip. Second, Israel has been targeting hospitals, which are sacred, sacred under international humanitarian law. And uh, again, the the health system is devastated, which is not just critical in itself. It's critical in order to provide the support to people who are injured at the time of war. And, And third, Israel has arrested and detained um, medical personnel doctors, nurses, abusing them and even torturing them. How can this be explained? This is why special rapporteurs have denounced through and through the risk of genocide and the health system speaks clearly to the intent to destroy the Palestinian people in Gaza. Francesca Albanese, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights in Palestinian Occupied Territory, interviewed on Al Jazeera TV. Al Jazeera's website has an article that Israeli President Isaac Herzog says that Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's comments comparing Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to Adolf Hitler are deeply offensive to every Jew around the world and to the memory of the millions of Jews who perished at the hands of the Nazis. In a statement, Herzog also said there is no struggle more just than the war against the terrorist organization Hamas, which brutally and barbarically murdered Jews as well as Muslims and those of other faiths and nationalities. The Turkish government's communication director, Faritin Atun, joined the fray and lambasted Netanyahu as the last person to talk about genocide and morality. He went on, posting, Netanyahu's desperate attempts to save his political career by killing civilians and expanding the war are doomed to fail. Our President Erdogan has called it for what it is, and he will not stop fighting for justice no matter How many lies Netanyahu tells the world? That reporting from Al Jazeera. The United Nations Security Council held an informal meeting today called by Russia on Ukraine's revolution that overthrew the pro-Russian government 10 years ago. The meeting was 
relatively one-sided. The briefers were invited by Russia and gave a narrative about the demonstrations that started in November 2013 in Ukraine, known as Euromaidan, describing them as nothing short as a, of a disaster for the country. The Russian ambassador to the United Nations, Vasily Nebetsia, in his statement agreed. Uh, now even pro-European Ukrainians do not deny that the association agreement was disadvantages for Ukraine and its implementation did more harm than good. We are not surprised by this outcome, not only because we warned about these consequences 10 years ago, but also because we know this is a typical scheme of neocolonial exploitation by Western countries that they impose on all those who agree to implement their geopolitical agenda. With this in mind, it is easy to answer the question why the decision of the Ukrainian government to postpone the signing of the agreement was met with so well-organized and coordinated protests. We have no doubts about the key role of the EU and the US in igniting, encouraging, and directing the protest of a loud minority using far-right radicals and neo-Nazis as a leverage. Western experts and politicians nowadays are increasingly vocal about this. One of the latest confirmations came from Congressman Thomas Massey, who bluntly said that the United States helped overthrow the elected government. We are well aware of this, of the disinformation technologies that were used at Maidan. Supposedly independent media and NGOs that in reality were financed by Western intelligence services instilled hatred and fear towards the authorities in the masses, manipulated public opinion, distorted and even falsified information. Let's take a closer look at how it unfolded. Video number one, please. As the disturbing events of Euromaidan started on November 21st, 2013, three new TV channels went on the air and suddenly became stunningly popular in Ukraine. Spill No TV, November 21st. Romatske TV, November 22nd. And Espresso TV, November 24th. Directly from opposition protest. These channels went viral, supporting the protests and encouraging more and more people to come to Maidan. November 30th of 2013 became the first turning point of Euromaidan and one of its most reported and mysterious events. It appears that the protesters were waiting for the police. Additionally, there were dozens of journalists and cameramen from all the new public TV news outlets prepared to cover the events. And most ominously, a group of well-trained young men arrived to Maidan almost simultaneously with the riot police. They infiltrated the crowd and began provocations with insults, stones, and torches. Outraged by what was reported in the news, the Ukrainian people came out in force on the next day to vent their anger with the police actions. In addition to these methods uh, regularly tested in other regions of the world, we witnessed the cynical, undisguised interference of foreign curators in the domestic political situation of Ukraine. The Russian ambassador to the United Nations, Vasily Nebetsia, at today's meeting of the UN Security Council, an informal meeting allowed under the rules held in New York City, called by Russia. And after the invited briefers gave their remarks, and again, they were all chosen by Russia, the ambassadors from other countries on the Security Council spoke, including Jason Park, political advisor to the U.S. mission at the U.N. Today's informal meeting is yet another shameless effort by Russia to justify its aggression against Ukraine. Today's meeting is another attempt to rewrite history through the prism of the Kremlin's distorted worldview. It is a reminder Russia prioritizes using this council to spread disinformation over the maintenance of international peace and security. We've heard Russia basically claim Ukraine's revolution of dignity was a foreign-sponsored coup, and more recently alleged it was neocolonialism. But let us be clear. Russia is a state carrying out a colonial and imperial war in Ukraine. Russia is a state striving to undermine democracy and affect regime change in Ukraine. The Kremlin's war has been repeatedly condemned by an overwhelming majority of UN member states. This war is a clear attempt by Putin to reconstitute a bygone Russian empire by force. 
We understand why the Russian Federation repeatedly calls for meetings on events from 10 years ago. It is because even after 10 years of organizing the same kind of meeting on the same topic, Russia has failed to sway the international community. The UN General Assembly has repeatedly and overwhelmingly condemned Russia's aggression and its efforts to redraw borders by force in flagrant violation of the UN Charter. We honor the bravery of ordinary Ukrainian citizens who stood up during the revolution of dignity for democracy, for Ukraine's right to choose its alliances, and for a Euro-Atlantic future. University students and Afghan war veterans alike stood fast in the face of sniper fire and brutal beatings. Over 100 were killed. Ukrainian citizens put their lives on the line to make it clear to leaders in Kyiv, to leaders in Moscow, and to the entire world that they wanted a democratic future. The people of Ukraine chose democracy then. Today, they are continuing to defend their choice, their independence, and their chosen destiny. It is difficult for the Kremlin to understand or accept the possibility of authentic public protest. After all, in Russia, the government seeks to control all information and opinion. Expressions of independent views are increasingly criminalized and suppressed. Russians who publicly speak out against the war are imprisoned. But those who live in free countries know dissent and peaceful assembly are essential to the resilience and success of open societies. Just as the people of Ukraine are unrelenting in defense of their freedom and democracy, the United States remains unwavering in our support of Ukraine and the principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity. Thank you. Jason Park is a political advisor to the U.S. mission to the United Nations at today's informal meeting of the Security Council held in New York City. The meeting was called by Russia and titled by Russia, 10 Years of Euromaidan in Ukraine, A Step into Abyss. SecurityCouncilReport.org notes that this meeting comes shortly after the European Union's December 14th decision to initiate membership talks with Ukraine. And an update on the ongoing war between Ukraine and Russia from the Telegram in the United Kingdom. New images have shown that the Russian warship in occupied Crimea that was hit by Ukrainian long-range missiles has been completely destroyed. The Russian Ministry of Defense confirmed that the landing ship had been damaged after explosions were seen yesterday at the port in eastern Crimea, but they stopped short of admitting that it had been hit beyond repair. Thanks for listening to Washington Today. Sign up for C-SPAN's evening newsletter, Word for Word. It's free. And get the stories making headlines in Washington emailed to you every day. Subscribe at cspan.org slash connect. Have a good night.